we're going to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence uh, and uh, tech diplomacy. Uh, and then, of course, you know, many of you who are involved in these topics also, um, it would be great to pull you in as, as well. And again, thanks uh, to Daniel and, and uh, for hosting us here at the Computer History Museum. Um, just, just, just as a few brief comments about uh, artificial intelligence as we get into it, and I'm sure there are people in the room who have spent a lot of time on this as well. Um, does anyone know when the term artificial intelligence was uh, invented? <laughs> 10 years ago? 20 years ago? Over half a century ago. So it's actually been around for a long time. And, and you, know, you could ask, well, how, we need to define our terms. Um, no, we don't. I mean, what, we, what we'd observe, of course, is that the definition of that term has actually migrated over time. So we're not going to be you know, uh, engaged in a complex diplomatic uh, discussion about exactly what that means. But I think it's often helpful to think, you know, look, th these are a set of technologies which, in many cases, exhibit what we might describe as intelligence. With that said, look, there's, there are, there's artificial intelligence happening all around the world, right? So why, why do we want to focus on and th this on an event that, you know, is a little bit focused on, the, on China versus the U.S., or China and the U.S., I should say. That was a bad turn of phrase. Um, look, this technology is becoming more and more distributed, the ability to use it because of cloud, et cetera, and there have been investments around the world. I mean, people know that, that you know, if there weren't investments by Canada over the past, you know, uh, AI winter, you might describe it, we wouldn't have deep learning and all those sorts of things. That said, you know, in our research at the McKinsey Global Institute, if you just you know, go out to the 100,000 foot level, a whole bunch of different metrics, whether it's investments, people, companies, et cetera, it is really basically a bipolar world, right? If you look at the US and China, that is where the bulk, in fact, the majority against many of these metrics uh, where the activity is occurring. Um, so we often hear this question, well, so who's going to win the AI race? Mm -hmm. And I've said, look, it's not a race. It's not even a decathlon. Maybe even, maybe it's an Olympics, right? Because it's not just one thing, right? It's not, it, you know, there's not a, an easy score. Um, and for different types of AI and different applications, you'll see um, one country or another move uh, forward or back. And by the way, it's not just technology, and it's just not just economics in terms of competition. But it, you know, what we're seeing is AI is affecting everything, whether it's the physical world for self-driving cars, right? We see them out here in the roads here in California, um, you know, to how it affects individuals and, in fact, how it affects the relationships between countries. So the second part of our discussion or the second aspect of our discussion in this collision is going to be um, technology diplomacy. And so with that, we'll turn to uh, Asia Society, one of our newest uh, uh, members of the Asia Society. Uh, so, Heather, what, what is tech diplomacy? Is this uh, robots uh, engaging in negotiations uh, for their countries? <laughs> well, as far as we know, not in 2020. I will add as well a fun little fact about uh, the origin of artificial intelligence as a term and also the origin of the Asia Society. Our organization started in 1956, the same year as the Dartmouth Project on Artificial Intelligence. Um, you also can't spell Asia without AI in it, but that's a bit of a stretch for the, um, to, to be honest. Back to the question about technology diplomacy, and I'll, um, I'll say again what a privilege it is for me to be up here on this stage, particularly beside someone who I see as one of the leaders in the world of technology diplomacy as it's burgeoning and emerging. I previously worked in an area that I would call tech policy. So, um, there's an amalgamation, amalgamation of individuals who have technical backgrounds, who are becoming more versed in the policy sphere, and working alongside bureaucrats or politicians to kind of cross those bridges. When I think of tech diplomacy, I think of tech policy with an overlay of international relations. A basic consideration for the fact that technology is not confined by borders, and so many of the domestic policies that we, we may think through or have the ability to work through with existing systems and norms and processes don't apply to new emerging technologies. Mm -hmm. And looking ahead 2020 and beyond, there's no shortage of exciting new developments that are no doubt upon the horizon. When these developments happen, they will impact the way that we live in a myriad of ways, which uh, will result in reactions from various groups. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a, a very interesting pacing problem that you see in terms of thinking about building technology policy. And for technologies that evolve very, very, very rapidly, the processes that we traditionally use to create um, policies. And I loved what you said about uh, Fadi earlier in your remarks about 
um, how in the West we tend to jump towards sort of the, the legal frameworks as opposed to the guardrails. Um, so I'm excited to discuss uh, guardrails and, and your framework for thinking through these areas because that maps a little bit better to how to properly keep pace with these emerging things. Are robots the ones doing diplomacy right now? I would say no. Um, when I think of technology diplomacy, and I'll uh, caveat that this is something at Asia Society that we're um, looking through how to better define the space of tech diplomacy. If you, um, in some areas, if you do a quick search on whatever uh, internet platform you prefer to use, um, if you look up digital diplomacy, tech plosy, diplomacy, tech diplomacy, um, e-governance, um, or sorry, not e-governance, but sort of e-diplomacy, they all kind of caveat around similar themes of um, technologies, how various states interact, and how uh, governments think through the, both the impacts of these systems mm. um, and the best ways to harness them and adopt them. So it's diplomats doing their work in the realm of technology. We have yet to properly define it, which is an area that perhaps the McKinsey Global Institute can assist us on here at Asia Society. Okay, um, but More the... work. <laughs> uh, yeah. But what's interesting, though, so funny about your story, um, you, I guess, uh, we could describe it as engaged in tech diplomacy, and yet you weren't a diplomat, at least. I mean, you, you couldn't, for instance, get out of a parking ticket the way a real diplomat could, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so that's interesting, right? I mean, uh, that tech diplomacy actually now, because of the way tech works, often will engage people. And so I'd, I'd love for you to reflect on that, that, that the players involved in, you know, these topics that cross country mm -hmm. um, uh, boundaries mm -hmm. actually won't necessarily necessarily always be official representatives of a country. So uh, what are your reflections? I mean, you were dealing with heads of state. There is no school in the world that is currently training people for that art, for that uh, profession. Uh, I was a fellow at both Harvard Kennedy and Oxford Blavatnik in the last few years. And even those schools are still struggling to find how to prepare people for this role. Um, tech diplomacy is complex for two reasons. The first is that unlike any other type of diplomacy, which is largely about understanding your boundaries, and protecting them through dialogue with the people outside those boundaries. It's generally what diplomacy does. We're a fortress. How do we make sure we open the right openings to deal with people, do business, do trade, but protect who we are? With tech diplomacy, technology doesn't have boundaries. When the inventors of the internet created it, they did not create any boundaries to the IP system. So the internet, just like the air we breathe, is probably the most transnational human-made resource ever created. It's not international. It is transnational. That means if someone creates a program in Cairo, it can affect our children in Los Angeles within a nanosecond. There is no mechanism to actually regulate how that technology travels. And that challenges normal diplomats because they're very used to, to a model that has existed for over 100 years since Westphalia that says we have borders, we have boundaries, we have nations, we have states. That's how we deal with each other. Well, the digital world doesn't function this way. And so we see a country like Denmark creating for the first time in history a digital ambassador and they moved him here, right? So some people have heard of that. What does that mean, a digital ambassador? He's trying. Believe me, even not Kas an avatar, Kasper right? himself. No, he's a real human being who's struggling like hell because no one understands what is exactly your role. You are your supra countries. You're kind of negotiating with So Facebook. he's the ambassador to whom? To, the, to all the digital world for the country of Denmark. And Singapore just announced they're doing the same. Switzerland just announced they're doing the same because there's almost a world, and I have just finished my work with the Secretary General at the UN on the new high-level high panel report, and you could tell that the institutions of the nation-state model, like the UN, 
frankly don't know how to deal with this. So there is a new layer being created uh, to create a new type of tech diplomacy. Is the embassy in Second Life? No, sorry, <laughs> no, never mind. It but, be. but it's interesting, right? Yeah. I mean, they, the, all yeah. of the characteristics of the diplomatic organization actually exist with regard to you know, the different functions. Correct, um, correct. Which is an interesting it's fascinating. It's, it's a whole new space, and it's different. We, I think you're spot on in saying that sometimes we confuse tech diplomacy with tech policy, when in fact they operate back to my three levels, at a completely different level. Um, diplomacy, when I had to convince President Rousseff to back off the breakup of the internet, she refused to see me. I was in Brasilia. I took the only Brazilian I know, my executive assistant. So I took her with me and I said, do you help me get into the palace to meet this lady? And I said, <laughs> well, what is your status? The guy at the door of the palace says, I'm, you know, I do this internet thing. Sorry, it's just not going to let you in. We spent three days living in the church across the street from the palace, going every few hours saying, got to see President Rousseff. I had no status. Back to the idea that, yes, quote unquote, I ran the logical infrastructure of the internet, but that's no status in the nation state model. I had no diplomatic status. And of course, at, the, at that time, Snowden had revealed what he did. So if it was bad enough that I was an American citizen, it was terrible if I had called the State Department to get me in. She didn't want to see anyone from the United States in November 2013. But diplomacy meant persistence, meant learning to really focus on what matters to bring people together. And when I saw her, we ended up really connecting at the level of common principles. Once she connected at that level, we were able to change her mind about the policy direction she was taking to divide the internet. But first we had to agree, what matters to you, Madam President? What is important to Brazilian democracy? And once we agreed on that, we were able to move into uh, the much tougher space of backing off those policies. So that's tech diplomacy. I didn't learn it, but it's common sense, as Ken and I were talking about. There's no magic here. It's just common sense and patience and hard work that is outside the legal and jurisdictional framework that we're so used to function in here. So let's draw this connection to, to, to AI. So Heather, you talk a little bit about what, what are those topics around AI where the uh, concept of tech diplomacy is most important? Mm. Uh, a flawless segue, thank you, because it's giving me the opportunity to discuss a little bit of the project that we're working on uh, currently. AI, as you mentioned, is a very broad subject. Uh, there's a great piece of work that looked at the various definitions. So a decade ago, we saw more than 70 definitions of the word. Clearly, it's very broad. There are a number of issues related to uh, what you might call the artificial intelligence operating environment. So for example, the processing or transfer of sensitive information related to health, that's an issue related to machine learning. So it's related to the AI operating environment, but you'd be not necessarily correct in saying that's an AI issue specifically. An approach that we're looking at currently um, with the projects that we're working on here at the Northern California office is a way to break down various issues connected to AI that are becoming prominent both in the jurisdiction of the United States as well as in the jurisdiction of China. Defining these issues, mm -hmm. observing and recording how they're being dealt with in both jurisdictions, so both actions that are being taken from a legal perspective, also what citizens or uh, domestic groups are saying or thinking about these areas. And we're using this as an exercise to show that there's, there, well, we'll see, but there um, it's probable that there'll be some alignment on specific issues, and in other areas there may be misalignment. Artificial intelligence is very broad. There's a, lot of, there's a number of national strategies, both in the United States, in China, in Canada. Um, I had the opportunity to work on that. Also, thank you for the shout-out earlier about research that we invested in during the AI winter. Um, but it's... What we're looking to do is to provide some more nuance to the notion of there's no possibility for collaboration between the United States and China on AI. That's a very broad statement. That's saying something akin to there's no possibility for collaboration in agriculture or in healthcare. And that 
uh, is a very broad statement that we believe deserves a little bit more attention. Mm -hmm. And so this is a methodology that we're testing. It's a methodology we hope could be applied in other technology diplomacy situations, mm -hmm. different technologies with different issues in different jurisdictions. Um, and it's an exciting experiment in a way. It's something that we're, we're hoping we'll be able to share not only what we've learned through the research period, but also an exercise that we hope will lead to further engagements and, and what we can optimistically hope will be a sort of more uh, collaborative future in certain ways. Mm -hmm. So I know it's early days, but what are some of the potential arenas where you know, collaboration or some sort of interaction between the US and China on AI might actually um, happen? Uh, there, Stanford launched a really great AI index um, recently, and in it they documented a number of ethical AI documents, both from various governments, various uh, public institutions, think tanks, et cetera. Um, why I'm bringing that up is that they highlighted specific larger themes within the very broad term of ethical AI. Broadly speaking, in most rooms, uh, regardless of the jurisdiction you're in, if you say, you know, we want ethical AI, everyone agrees, and the conversation tends to stop because it's very difficult to get down what you mean in that way. Um, a lot of the, the, the research from Stanford showed that a lot of these key themes were around fairness and interpretability. Fairness is tough. There's more than 21 different, different definitions of fairness. Utilitarianism is, is, can be fair. Being very individualistic can be fair as well. Um, what I'm anticipating at this point with the feedback that we have is the issues we'll be looking at are likely to tie into interpretability or explain, um, methods for explaining and in what avenues those make sense. Um, there may be something around uh, again, pause, uh, uh, interpretability or explainability. What, yeah. what, what's the challenge um, there? So the, uh, how I like to think about explainability, um, and I'm open to being corrected on this because I, I realize that there are different interpretations, um, is effectively if there is a system, an, an outcome from a system, how do you explain how that system came to reach that conclusion? Yeah. Um, so basically the explaining of a, a thought process. I think intellectually a lot of us like the idea of if we're relinquishing control, or rather um, taking the human out of the loop of a decision that's being made, we'd like to have an explanation as to how that conclusion was reached. The counter to that is naturally that uh, individuals are imperfect in explaining how we make decisions. Um, and uh, there is a, there's been a lot of interesting different camps, because this has been raised in the GDPR, um, that the EU brought forth as a very interesting piece uh, of digital um, regulations, I suppose, um, but the right, to ex the right to explain. So basically, uh, if an autonomous system reaches a conclusion, uh, you must be able to explain how that was reached, but that's uh, an imperfect science. So that's sort of mm. broad strokes how I think through explainability. It's obviously a little bit in the weeds, um, but it's also, uh, it, it's in the weeds, so it's, it, it will be interesting to see as this project unfolds. We're starting now. We're looking to be releasing something by June, but it's going to be a very iterative process. So if you keep following Asia Society Northern California, you may be hearing from me with looks for more inputs on various things that we're working on. But explainability on. is one of those potential areas of collaboration. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fadi, I, you mentioned guardrails, and I think one, um, let's call it application of AI, is, is in the military, right? Mm -hmm. So people have talked about lethal autonomous weapon systems and all those sorts of things. I'd love to get your reflections on guardrails, particularly as you think about these technologies as applied yeah. to the military in U.S. and China? <laughs> Just before I delve into this, I want to uh, uh, frankly tell you that uh, my team and I have been following Heather's progress and her work at the Asia Society. And if you have not, I encourage you to. I think um, the decision of the Asia Society to delve into this is important. Um, it's one that deserves our attention, and I'm uh, very heartened by Heather's leadership of this. I, I think that we will see in the months ahead some real important uh, new guidelines that can help us advance rather than just continue to do this. So uh, I, I encourage everybody to focus on that work and to support Heather. Um, I also want to say something about AI. I think. Uh, just like with the network, with, with, with the internet, we see it as a monolithic thing, the network, the internet. Just as I described to you a little bit today, it's a lot more complex than that. What makes up this digital infrastructure is far more than the net, right? All we see is what's on our phone and the applications. 
in reality, there are layers and layers and layers of things beneath that network. And I think AI is no different. We all look at AI as just some monolithic thing. It isn't. There are many layers that we will need and can agree on and build some common ground to enable the reality of AI to happen. And the second comment I just wanted to make quickly on AI is that, again, coming from a computer scientist myself, we sometimes think of these things, frankly, in a very uh, vertical way. It's like we see the auto autonomous car. It's like the autonomous car lives on its own. There's a whole world around the autonomous car. And so sometimes we look at AI and we forget there, is, there are these seven billion humans around it that need to interact with it. The idea that AI on its own is going to do X or Y or Z, I think is false. And therefore, this is far more complex. The, the work we still have to do to integrate the human and the artificial is huge. We're just, I studied AI at Stanford in 85. As you said, this is an old science. It's existed for a long time. We're just starting to understand how it will be applied. What is fueling the focus is, of course, the internet, the fact that data is now abundant. Now, onto your question, which is a very important question, and frankly, one of the hardest things the UN high-level panel dealt with. Because weaponizing technology is what's happening in the, frankly, the two big economies we're talking about here. Um, I mean, outside of China and the US, there's, a, there's some serious weaponizing happening in a couple of countries you wouldn't have focused on, for example, the Netherlands, very focused on that. But in general, it's mostly between the US and China. And uh, the weaponization of technology is a very serious business, and it is happening. Um, I'm not sharing new news to you, but Brad Smith, the, the president of Microsoft, recently spoke in Davos and described that he got uh, an order to sign a sales order, very large sales order, that even had the attention of his board, uh, to put facial recognition technology in a drone. And he asked the salesman, you know, who are we selling this to? And he named the country. And he said, well, did you check of course, he's the salesman. He sold the deal. He said, well, you know, it's good. He said, it's not good. And so when you ask, when Brad Smith was talking about this, the president of Microsoft, and it's a fascinating uh, discussion to have with him, about what would stop companies from actually selling technology to bona fide partners, other clients. And there are no laws. He said, there are no laws against Microsoft selling this. There are no rules even. There are no policies. So he says, well, I set a Microsoft guardrail. And I shared it with my client and others. Look, this is a guardrail. We can't, certain things we're not going to do. It's, is it based on a law? No. Is it based on a policy? Also no. But it just doesn't feel right until we know more things. And they started developing a framework around the idea of selling facial recognition technology that was known to be about to be hoisted on a drone. So look, I do think that this is a very, very gray world. We still don't understand how companies, because remember, this is something we didn't bring up, I want to bring up quickly. What's happening also in the digital space, in AI in particular, is that most governments are suddenly feeling that they lost a lot of power to companies. And that's new. When we were doing the UN report, this was obvious. Those amongst us who were representing governments really felt the sapping of their power to businesses. And this shift of power from businesses to governments is a big one, is a huge one. From governments to business. Governments to business. And we don't know yet where this will end. And I think that the third rail, which is still what's missing, to actually balance the power fight between governments and businesses, is really us, the people, the public, that needs to have some mechanism of affecting this power struggle. So 
In weapons, it gets hard because the people have no voice except through electing their officials. So the power becomes largely between governments trying to do something to Brad Smith, for example, say, give me this technology so I can have some power. What is the role of the government? What is the role of the business? And there are no rules and policies in place to do this. This is what we're struggling at, at Harvard Kennedy and at Oxford Blavatnik to try and start to define a new regime of transnational guardrails. And that's work we're uh, putting some effort on. Nora Busita, who's here, who's heading our new foundation, the Digital Ethos Foundation. We're trying to find mechanisms to actually build those guardrails in the, in the year ahead. So Brad's a lawyer, so he, I'm sure he thinks about <laughs> policies as well. But I'm curious, you know, given we're talking about the US and China, the description you had about government power migrating to business. Any perceptions about the about that in China? The, the line between government and businesses ch in China is, is of different thickness than what we're accustomed to. Uh, it just has a different shape. You're not a diplomat, really. <laughs> I, uh, it's, uh, look, I, I, I'm not one to say, as some do, that every business in China is completely uh, at the behest of government policies. I do think it's more gray than that. I do think there is uh, movement around that. And I think we ought to be very attentive and listen carefully to where the government and businesses are trying to find a place. Because the government is very clear that their businesses must compete globally. This is important. There was a time when China still thought of itself as a developing country. That wasn't too long ago. I was engaged with China in the 2012, 2013, when they kept telling me, we're just a developing country. We're trying to figure out our place against all of you big players. Sometimes they still say that. I know, on but in reality, under Xi Jinping, I think we've seen a shift to start understanding. We need to have a global role, and our companies need to play on the global stage. So what do we need to do? And I will, I will finish my answer to you on this point by, by lamenting that there was a point, and some of us in this room I know worked on this, there was a point in the 2014 time frame where the Chinese government and businesses tried to get an equal seat at the table in some of our institutions that have governance roles in the digital world and we did not let them. It was a missed opportunity. They tried to start being treated as equals at the tables where things were being decided, and it didn't quite work. And so there was a reaction to that that happened in the 2014, 2015 timeframe. I hope that we don't make this mistake again. Uh, China is a major player, and instead of taking that energy that they're trying to invest to become a global player and cornering it or snuffing it, I think that energy will go somewhere else. I think we should embrace it and be respectful and engage because there is an opportunity to still do so. And what are these digital institutions? Examples? Well, for, I mean, in the world I was living in, you have uh, ICANN, you have the IETF, you have all the organizations defining the core standards and principles and protocols that run the, the digital world. And being at the table in these institutions, and I was the head of one, um, frankly, these are still very US-created institutions and US-dominated uh, institutions. And, and they set a lot of the principles that define how this digital world works. So I think there has to be mechanisms where we engage um, as much as we can at an equal level and bring the fight to those tables, bring the fight and the dialogue to those tables rather than shut the doors. So I'm gonna to come to the group in a moment, so have your questions getting ready, but let me just, uh, Heather, if I could just engage you on one other topic. Um, sure. Which is, you know, I think we've seen, uh, certainly here in, around the San Francisco Bay Area, a tremendous supply demand imbalance for AI talent. Um, and 
you know, look, a lot of the, the algorithms, the work is actually open source. It, it moves fairly easily, and yet people don't necessarily. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it came up earlier today as well um, with regard to how people from different countries are treated in different places by different organizations. I'd love to get your reflections on AI talent and cross-border flows of people and what, what, what you're observing there. Uh, um Absolutely, it's a major challenge. NeurIPS, a major um, AI conference, was held in Vancouver just in December, and several researchers who'd been accepted with well, workshop papers uh, just to have the opportunity to travel for this conference into Canada had trouble as well. So it's a Canada, it, yeah, it even, it, <laughs> even up there, eh? Um, so it's it's fascinating because there's a couple key differences that. Um, speaking to the, the point about being a traditionally more open source field in general, um, where I think there might be a misalignment between uh, the top-down understanding of how a system works and the sort of, in the area of where the system is working, understanding of how it works. Um, and so the stop or the blocking of accessing visas or allowing talent to stay and to work in certain fields, I think is a, a big challenge. Um, I'm doing a poor job of answering this. What I'm really am trying to say from, from the question is, I think it's a, a massive challenge. I'm very disheartened to see the fact that uh, great research talent is not having the opportunity to study with other great researchers in various areas. I'm very passionate about the importance in fundamental research and fundamental science in particular. Uh, and it's, it's disheartening, it's extremely disheartening, it's very sad to see that there are some um, pressures that various higher level institutions are getting to uh, with, with regards to which types of students they're accepting. Um, the cross flow of information is incredibly important. It, what, what, just, what, yeah. what is that about? Yeah. What, what is that about? Yeah, you said you, challenges about uh, students being accepted. Yeah, so what um, do you mean by that? So I, um, I will say that I don't have the exact numbers out of my head, but I'm certain someone in this room does. But a number of um, even undergraduate students, I think, in the, um, from mainland China who had study visas to come to, to the United States, uh, there is pressure against accepting a certain number of those students this past year. Uh, that's my impression, I'm, uh, but I'm convinced that someone else in this room likely would have more information, uh, considering the types of people that we've gathered here today at this conference. Um, but that's an indication of a cause, I think, for a f fair bit of alarm, in part because it's, in, it's entirely uh, essential for the field itself to can progress with the contributions of all the best minds at the table. Yeah. Um, and the best minds exist all over. Uh, secondly, um, the further engagement that we have, uh, not only better for the field, but better for understanding of the field. If we have the development of this technology in isolated poles, then there is a gap in understanding about what type of developments are happening, which I think as a whole makes us all worse off. And the reason that we're all worse off is that we can't collectively consider the um, not only the potentially phenomenal applications of these types of things, but also um, more, uh, let's say, challenging or less uh, thought-provoking in a negative way, potential applications of certain things. You can't be well-versed in what's going on if you don't know what's going on by blocking the collaboration of research. Um, it is a very open source environment, but naturally, I, I think it's also fair to sort of assume that certain um, cutting edge uh, researches that are happening, particularly in private labs, may not be getting published as soon as, as they happen. That would make sense. Um, but uh, to, to sum up, um, it's, it, it's my opinion that it's incredibly important for great researchers to have the opportunity to collaborate, to work together, to share knowledge. Um, and it's in the best interest of all of us collectively that we're able to advance fundamental science in that way. Mm -hmm. Well, let's open it up to um, folks in the room. I'm sure there's a, a lot that people want to talk about. And uh, wait till the mic gets in. If you wouldn't mind identifying yourself. And um, the one rule about the question period is uh, to ask a question. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my name is Yi. Uh, I'm a principal engineer working for uh, End Financial. We run Alibaba's payment system known as Alipay. Um, yeah, I I'm working on the AI infrastructure of End Financial. So uh, uh, I. My question is, do many American people know that uh, many Chinese private enterprises are actually um, playing a distance from the Chinese government? So the logic is like this. Here in the US, most people believe that free market 
is good for economy. However, in China, we're somehow more、uh, government controlled, so there is a competition between the two ideas.、Uh, according to my personal experience talking to Chinese entrepreneurs, I feel like most of them believe that free market is a better strategy.、Mm-hmm. We talk about the weaponizing of computer vision. Let me come back to the original rule. <laughs> all right, all right.、Uh, so your question is:、uh, Do Americans believe that Chinese uh, uh, private enterprises is, is is important?、Uh, so there is a distance between Chinese private-owned state、uh, companies from、right. the government. Do I'm just curious. I'm a new American. Do most Chinese,、uh, American people know that? And do you know Trump's strategy is definitely pushing Huawei, a private enterprise, maybe closer to the government? Okay, that's the second question. But、um, how many people have heard of Ant Financial? Your, your company is fairly well known.、Um, any reflections on the U.S. view of、uh, non-SOEs in China? I will jump at this as the Canadian on the stage, naturally. <laughs>、um, what I think Americans think.、Um, so, it, it's my current impression that、uh, China is largely viewed as a monolith,、um, and in part, and that was spoken about earlier today.、Uh, that's as a result of external communication. Um, regarding the country, in part,、um, and when I moved to Beijing, it was.、Uh This is sort of the classic story, but you know, foreigner moves to Beijing or moves somewhere in China, realizes how much diversity exists within the country, realizes how large it is, realizes how many shades of gray or nuances there exist in areas, or perhaps variations in the th- thickness of lines, or perhaps existence of those lines. So my 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 only comment on that is it's、um, my current understanding that.、Uh, It's probable, as a result of information that's being fed to individuals, that they'll have a very sort of siloed view of、um, of a very big and complex place.、Um, it's my hope that through events like the, this one and others that we've had at the Asia Society, more of those areas of nuance can be explored and further discussed.、Uh, but I'll, I guess, kind of leave it there. Any、like、any reflections、on? on、uh, this monolithic view actually pushing Chinese non-SOEs closer to the government? Or making it easier for the government to get、mm. closer to them.、Mm. Yeah. That's his response. All right. Other questions. Whoever has the microphone gets to ask the question. That's, <laughs>、uh, I'm going to rely on the microphone. Power of the mic.、Yes. Thank you very much to our, our three panelists. It's been really interesting to listen to you.、Uh, my name is Benjamin. I, I、uh, work at Ascend,、um, and my question is for Mr. Shiade. Um, what is your view and experience with the、uh, Chinese firewall? And do you,、um, in in your opinion, are there things that the global community can do to help the Chinese government feel more comfortable? For instance, lowering you know their vil- vigilance at that point. And what kind of future do you see for the firewall? Thank you. You did assert that there aren't borders, but. Look,、uh, regrettably,、um, um, I can say that I think there will be many more Chinese-like firewalls erected in the next few years,、uh, and it's regrettable because we lose one of the core principles of the internet. Having said that, when we were describing to the Chinese government where we live in the ICANN space. Which is one layer below the firewall. They definitely didn't want to put a firewall there. So it's important to understand that as much as there are walls being erected in that layer, the apps layer I call it, or the kind of not in a technical way, in a, in a consumer way,、uh, they don't want to break what's beneath. They actually understand. Nor does Saudi Arabia, nor do, do some of the other countries that are now buying the Chinese firewall technology and investing in it.、Um, so we're going to see a fragmentation and fracturing at that layer, regrettably,、uh, because I think it will reduce the flow of good business and good ideas and good services.、Uh, the good news is we held up from breaking what's even underneath, because if that was broken up, then frankly that's irreparable. We would have not been able to ever come back. The the walls that exist today 
are frankly removable. But if we split the actual infrastructure, that's very hard to back off from. So whilst I am pessimistic about the next couple of years, uh, given that these walls are creating fortresses that are not dissimilar from the political fortresses that we see being formed today. So the digital world will mimic the political world. But they are also removable, just like politics could change, those are removable. So I do have hope in the long term because water will always find a way, as it has for the last few years through the Chinese wall. Other questions? Hi, my name is Colin Garvey. I'm a uh, postdoctoral fellow at the Stanford uh, Human Centered AI Institute. Uh, thanks for the great panel. Really enjoyed it. Um, I had a question about um, going back to the kind of three tiered framework um, Fadi introduced, which I really like. Um, it seems to me, at a fundamental level of values, there may be a conflict around this issue of democracy. And you also raised the issue that, that right now there's no. Uh, venue for the people to have a say in this fight between governments and businesses. And so uh, if as Americans and maybe Canadians we hold democracy <laughs> as a core value um, going forward, what room do you see for agreement uh, on policies with China and how might we increase uh, this the expression of this value in our own uh, nation, which I think right now is a, on a lot of people's minds. Thank you. You didn't tell me there will be deep questions here. <laughs> Asia Society. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the great work your center does. Very, really impressive. Um, look, uh, when you become a diplomat, you start learning that um, nothing is what it seems. And you're able to move things around to accommodate a situation. So when I use that model, for example, if you remember, the one I told my son was values, beliefs, and traditions. And the one I suggest for our world is principles, guardrails, and policies. The democratic um, principles by which we live I conveniently move them to the guardrail section. And it works, by the way. So you actually say, look, I, I, you clearly have your own guardrails as to how much you will allow your people to do versus what we would do. Is this something I could move down to the area of principles? Not now. So as a diplomat, you conveniently say, why don't we agree that this would be in the guardrail section? There will be some nuance about what does it mean to give your people certain freedoms that we take for granted here. And so the movement of things in that system is delicate. It's, it has to be done thoughtfully. But I will say one thing I had shared with Ken. My experience with the Chinese, and this is just my personal experience, is that if you are not firm about your principles and the ones you will not move on, you actually lose their respect. So unfortunately, many of our business people, including myself, I'm a business person who's run companies and continues to run companies, when we are in the heat of trying to make a deal, we're willing to compromise to get the deal done. And I think sometimes we go too deep. So whilst I'm, I'm, I don't mean to contradict myself, I'm just trying to tell you that there are some things, as Abraham Lincoln said, <laughs> that you need to hold on to, and you stand on these. And if you don't, you actually get less respect in a tradition like China's that is deep and steeped in tradition and beliefs. So you calculate this very carefully depending on the situation you're in. But there are some things, it doesn't matter what your situation is, you hold on to. And this one, the one you brought up, having grown up in a war zone, I grew up in Beirut, actually, um, you realize that sometimes there are some things you believe are immovable that may need to be movable. 
and that the things that are movable are very few and you hold on to this. And I've developed that system for myself and I hope every person engaging with China also develop that system for themselves. Just to build on this comment about flexibility too, uh, you know, you mentioned it, the digital institution of the Internet en Engineering Task Force, or IETF. Uh, they state, uh, we believe in rough consen consensus in running code. We reject kings, presidents, and voting. So not even in, in the Internet, not everything is a democracy. Um, <laughs> other questions? Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Padilla. I'm a fellow at Stanford's Future of Currency Institute. Uh, we've been very much focused on digital currency, digital fiat currency. And what we've seen is that you know, the PBOC in Beijing has been very, very aggressive in rolling out digital assets using you know, Alipay and WeChat. I guess my question is, given the heavy investment in physical infrastructure by Beijing, and pressure on existing multilateral institutions. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that the current institutions will be able to de-escalate existing tensions, or do you see something like the PBOC trying to take on the dollar's reserve currency be a real flashpoint in this collaboration on digitization of, of assets and monetary instruments? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Um, so I'll begin with saying uh, that uh, largely the area of digital currency is not currently the focus of what we're looking on with uh, the technology diplomacy program that we're running, but it is a great example of another area wherein the types of work that we're doing will kind of copy and paste very well using um, experts like yourself to better understand what the issues are. I think, um, if I understand correctly, uh, the, the question is sort of, along the same lines of things are changing. Um, do the current models of how we operate still work for understanding the things that are advancing? Um, and I think that in any case, when you look at an institution, and you, it's always easy to find flaws in institutions and areas of potential improvement. Mm -hmm. um, and you either sort of improve upon what you have or you create something net new. And the risk of creating something net new is that it's not adopted adopted properly or it doesn't have the proper mechanisms in order to enforce anything um, reasonable. Uh, this is another example of, um, I'm sure that there's great investments being made both from the human capital perspective and perhaps also with financial capital as well to upskill um, and recruit people who have deep understanding of these things into those multilateral institutions. That's probably happening. I'm sure there's some great movement in terms of net new projects that are happening. Um, and uh, Either of those answers or response of both of them might be the solution to how you solve this problem. Um, what will depend on if the key, well, well, I think the, the core thing that matters is if people at the highest level who have the decision making power um, invest in and take time to go along with whatever outcome, um, whichever sort of convening body runs. But um, I didn't really speak to the uh, going after the reserve currency, frankly, because that's not an area that I have much um, insightful things to share. I'm happy to. Hunt it to the rest of the panel, though. I mean, just a quick add-on. Thank you, Heather. Look, this is one of the areas, if you recall, I mentioned there is a shift of power between governments and businesses. This is the area that has the biggest impact on the shift of power from businesses to government, the area of digital currencies. And governments are sincerely, extremely worried about where this area will go. The second comment I'll make is... Uh, Please remember that at the end of the day, a, the trust factor is the most important thing behind whichever currency ends up being the reserve of the world. So it doesn't matter if it's digital or not digital. It matters who's behind it. And therefore, focus on that. It doesn't matter what the technology can bring. Let's focus on who is going to provide the trust that the world needs behind these currencies. And that may give you a clue to the answer to your excellent question. I know there are asset managers in the room, so you feel free to collect uh, over the break. Other questions? Get Andrew down here. Hi there. I'm uh, Richard Hogg from Intel. Thank you very much for your very relevant um, discussion today. 
Uh, I'm going to come back to that shift from uh, government to the shift in power from government to business. I think I probably work for one of those businesses. Um, and you, you touched on um, this transnational guardrails and kind of the, the role that businesses should be playing in that space. I was wondering if you could provide a few more kind of examples or thoughts on mm. how companies, tech companies, could play a more positive role mm. in that space. Mm. Without tech companies, and there are really nine tech companies that matter in the world today. Which ones? <laughs> <laughs> He missed the diplomat part of my new title. <laughs> Four are in China and five are in the U.S., and I think you all know them. Wait, what's but the fifth? <laughs> <laughs> so those nine companies must have a big role to play in setting those guardrails, but they cannot do it in a vacuum. They must engage with governments, and they must engage with civil society. If they figure out how to bring those three legs into a place where guardrails are being discussed. Uh, look, I think what Einstein and his friends did in 1957 up in uh, Pugwash, Canada, is needed at this time. Can you uh, remind us, for those of us who weren't there? I wasn't either. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was not even close. But uh, <laughs> Pugwash was, is a city in Nova Scotia where uh, many of the Nobel Prize winners in physics, led by uh, Einstein at the time, met and had a conference. And they started setting, frankly, the guardrails. In fact, they used that word. They couldn't set policies because they were scientists and business people. But they set guardrails for the use of nuclear technology. And it is out of Pugwash that 20 years later, most of the nuclear non-proliferation treaties came out. It was inspired by the work these people did. We need a pugwash for the digital age. That's what we're missing. We need a meeting between the people uh, that matter with also, frankly, a sprinkling of people who can bring us together at the principal level. Maybe some ethicists as well. Maybe some people who understand how governments work so that we can bring the governmental side into this. So some of the work, frankly, that Nora and I have been leading and will be working on, partly with the Asia Society and with others, is to bring together a group of senior business players and government players and ethicists and civil society players to start discussing a framework for those guardrails, just like Pugwash achieved, and frankly, much closer to us here uh, in Asilomar, the biotech industry did as well, much later, I think in 78 or 87, one of the two, they also got together here and started creating guardrails for that sector. We are in need of that now. And if you look at the timing of these things, it always happens about 20 years after something has been introduced. And I think we're in that 20 year mark for since when the internet became a global phenomenon in the mid 90s, late 90s. So um, I hope Intel will be a part of that, but I also hope many of the companies represented here will actually participate with an open mind on the creation and the setting of those guardrails. And Asilomar, as well as Pugwash, are worth a read so you get a sense to answer your question more fully as to where do the guardrails go. All right, it's time for the lightning round. Whew, okay. You guys ready? Quick, quick questions, quick answers, feel free to pass. She's quicker than me, so she goes first. We'll start with you, Fadi. <laughs> what is your favorite source of information about AI in the US? I actually uh, follow a lot of the work that comes out of Stanford on AI. Uh, it's a very thoughtful group of people. Uh, and I really like what they've done. I also have liked very much the IEEE work in that area, the Institute of Engineers. Uh, they've issued a couple of excellent papers on how AI will evolve for all of us. Heather, same question. Uh, CSET's Policy AI newsletter. I like Import AI's newsletter from Jack Clark. I also really like um, 
AI Now, it might be called. I subscribed to it a long time ago, but I get it bi-weekly. Um, and it's a, a, it's a highlight of key trends um, along with uh, guiding principles that you should read. And there's also discussions about what's going on in different ecosystems. You're going to have to go faster. Uh, Heather, what's your favorite source of information about AI in China? Oh, Chin AI, Jeff Ding's um, uh, subscription, also free. Um, and did you China's work? They're up with Stanford, but also in Berkeley. Fadi. People. I actually go and meet some people there. <laughs> what excites you most Working about the potential? Budget. What What excites you most about the potential for tech diplomacy to do good in the world, Fadi? To actually enable tech policy and tech uh, diplomacy to come from the bottom up. I love that because a lot of diplomacy is top down, but I think we have an opportunity to build into frankly, the actual engineers and the scientists who are building this, a sense of newness and of working together that can change the way AI will be built in the years ahead. Heather, what excites you most? Uh, technology is complicated. When things are complicated, people get confused. When people are confused, they don't trust each other. When people don't trust each other, bad things happen. Yeah. I don't want that to That's what excites happen. you the people most? Trust each well other. Said. <laughs> that was supposed to be a positive. <laughs> oh, no. That's why I'm motivated. Oh, OK. That's very good. Uh, <laughs> Heather, what's the one thing the US and Chinese governments could do to ensure the best outcomes for using AI? Uh, be more transparent with each other and uh, try to build trust. Fadi. Let their engineers talk to each other. Fadi, what's the worst thing the US and Chinese governments could do with regard to the potential for AI for good? To create monolithic fortresses of technology. Uh, I keep reminding them of one word. Some of you are too young to remember, but Minitel. <laughs> Minitel, uh, the French invention that preceded the internet. Uh, where is Minitel today uh, when they try to create a monolithic solution it's, versus it's, Vint Cerf opening up the internet? Intel is the it's here in the museum. Uh, Heather? <laughs> um, Precisely. Uh, worst thing, most... worst thing oh, the U.S. and Chinese Oh, worst thing, not engaging at all. Uh, Heather, which diplomat of the world is most knowledgeable about tech issues? Most knowledgeable? Casper, um, all right. the, the Danish tech investor. Buddy? Um, I do think we have, I can't name names, but there are some people in the US government that really get it. Right. Which technology leader in the world is most knowledgeable about diplomacy? Fadi. Which technology in the world? The technology leader, person. Oh, uh, definitely Brad. Brad Smith. Brad Smith, okay. Yeah. I've yet to meet all of them. So I can't, I can't tell you, I don't know yet. All right, all right. It's my pass. Uh, and finally, what piece of advice do you have for people in this room? Heather. Hmm. Uh, ask questions. Fadi. Don't be afraid. Please thank our panelists. Thank you.